Today we're going to look at Descartes' method for finding tangents to curves. And sometimes this is called the method of subnormals. And it relies on the following well-known fact, but we're going to prove this fact kind of just for completeness. And that is that a radius of a circle is normal to the circle. So I've got a picture of that situation over here. I've got this circle with center O, and then I've got a tangent line to the circle over there L, and then a radius, which is OP. So you know like a radius would be normal to the circle if and only if it is perpendicular to the tangent line at that point. So that's why I put that uh, line L there, which is tangent to the circle. Okay. So we're going to start off by picking another point along that line that we'll call Q. And this is just not any other point. It's some point so that the line segment OQ intersects the line L at a right angle. And so you might say, well, how do we know that Q is not automatically equal to P? Which is, of course, what we're trying to prove. And actually, we allow Q to be equal to P. And as you'll see, that will be related to a degenerate triangle. Okay, so obviously, the way that I've drawn this picture here, the line segment OQ is clearly not perpendicular to the line L. But of course, that's because the line segment OP is, well, that is what we're going to prove is perpendicular to L. Okay, nice. But now from here, let's notice that the triangle OPQ uh, is a right triangle. So since it's a right triangle, we can use, well, the Pythagorean theorem on that triangle. And well, furthermore, well, we need to know what the hypotenuse is, which is clearly OP here. So we'll have OQ squared plus PQ squared is equal to OP squared. Okay, nice. But now let's observe that P is on the circle and it's the only point that's on the line and on the circle. So that me means that Q, well, it's either equal to P or it's outside of the circle. But if it's equal to P, then OQ squared is the same thing as OP squared. And if it's outside of the circle, then OQ squared is bigger than OP squared. So either way you have it, you have that OP squared is less than or equal to OQ squared. Okay, nice. But now let's go over here and notice that PQ squared is always bigger than or equal to zero because it's the square of a real number. So since that's bigger than or equal to zero, we have this PQ squared plus OQ squared is bigger than or equal to OQ squared. But observe that we've just sandwiched OP squared between two OQ squareds, but that means that OP is the same thing as OQ. But then since they lay on the same line, that means that P must be equal to Q. But let's recall that Q was chosen to be so that OQ was perpendicular to the line. So that means that OP is perpendicular to the line, but that's exactly what we needed for this fact. Okay, so let's see how we can use this fact to construct, well, tangents to curves, which is what Descartes did. Now that we've got that fact taken care of, let's see how that can be used to calculate, well, slopes of tangent lines. So we're going to start with a curve, y equals f of x. So we're putting it inside the Cartesian coordinate plane, which shouldn't be too big of a surprise because it is Descartes' method of tangents. Okay, so we've got this curve y equals f of x and a point, I'll call it capital P, but it has coordinates P, f of P. So it's on the curve. And then we're going to find another point, which I'll call O, and a radius R, so that the circle centered at O with radius R intersects our curve exactly one time. And that one time is at P. But that means that it's necessarily tangent to the curve at this point. 
Okay, but that means that the radius OP is perpendicular to the curve at that point. And that's a fairly easy line segment to get a hand on because we know its coordinates of its endpoint and its starting point. And from there, you can calculate the slope of OP, but then OP is orthogonal to the curve or perpendicular to the curve. That's because it's perpendicular to the circle and the circle is parallel to the curve, if you will, tangent to the curve. But then if you know the slope of a perpendicular line, then you know the slope of a tangent line just by you know, using the standard rule for slopes of perpendicular lines. And so in the end, we can calculate the slope of that tangent line. So here's a picture of the situation. We have our curve y equals f of x. We have our point p right here. And then from that, we're going to calculate a point O and a radius R so that when we make that circle, it intersects one time. So that's what we have here. And then as you can see, the curve and the circle share a tangent line at that point. And then this OP will be orthogonal to the tangent line and thus orthogonal to the curve. Okay, so now let's do an example where we get our hands dirty with some calculation. Okay, so here's our example. We've got the curve y equals x squared, and we're going to find the slope of the tangent at 3, 9. And so notice that's an x value of 3. We know the derivative of x squared is 2x, so we should expect that slope to be 6. And if we don't get that, well, then this method is not reasonable for finding the slope of the tangent. But of course, historically, historically we know this should work, so we should end up with 6. Okay, so I've sketched out the situation here. So observe that in our setup over here, we need to find a point O and a radius R. In this case, we can put our point O along the x-axis. So I've got it over here at the point A comma zero. And then, well, the point along the curve is this point right here. I'll call it capital P, but that's our three comma nine point. Okay, so let's see what we've got going on here in terms of equations. So the equation is this of the circle is x minus a squared plus y squared equals r squared. And we know that that should intersect the curve y equals x squared at the point 3 comma 9. I guess uh, as we'll see, the important thing is that this intersects at the point which corresponds to the x value of 3. Okay, nice. So where are we going to go from here? Well, we're going to take this equation of the circle. Observe that we kind of want to know the point A and, well, the radius R. We actually don't need the radius R so much as the point A. Because if we have this point A, well, then we can easily find the slope between A0 and P and then, well, take the negative reciprocal of that and then we have the slope of the tangent. Okay. So let's take these two blue box equations and smash them together, get a single equation. So we're going to take y and replace it with x squared. And that's going to give us this equation x minus a quantity squared plus x to the fourth equals r squared. So something like that. And then, well, notice that this equation should have only one solution and that one solution should be the point where x is equal to three so let's write that down so should have one solution and like i said that solution is x equals three because if it had more than one solution well then it would intersect this parabola twice but our goal is for that to intersect the parabola once but now we could rewrite that as a quartic polynomial having one real root. So let's maybe expand this out. We'll have x to the fourth plus x squared minus 2ax. 
and then it'll be plus a squared minus r squared equals zero, that should have one maybe real solution, which is at x equals three. But if we've got a quartic polynomial that has a single real solution and that single real solution is x equals three, well, we know that how that quartic polynomial factors and it factors like this. So x to the fourth plus x squared minus two ax plus a squared minus r squared should factor as x minus three squared times an irreducible quadratic polynomial. And that's just based off of the fact that complex roots come in conjugates. They come in complex conjugate pairs. So if this has only one real solution of x equals three, well, then it should either have maybe four copies of the root x equals three, which it clearly doesn't, just based off of the fact that x minus three to the fourth power will never expand like this. Or it has to have two copies of the root x equals three. And then, well, the other two complex roots will be in complex conjugate pairs. If it has, well, three roots that are x equals three, well, then it has another real root. And similarly, if it has one root of x equals three, it must necessarily have one other real root. So anyway, this is the only possibility. But then we know the shape of an irreducible quadratic polynomial. That has the form, well, I'm gonna take this x minus three squared down, and then it'll have the form of x minus h quantity squared plus k squared. So that's the general form of an irreducible quadratic. Okay, so, well, now what we can do is multiply out that right-hand side. I'm gonna copy this all down here. So we have x to the fourth plus x squared minus 2ax plus a squared minus r squared. Now it must be equal to the following. So we've got x to the fourth minus 2h plus six times x cubed. And then plus we'll have, let's see, it'll be k squared plus h squared. And then plus 12h plus nine times x squared. And then after that, it'll be a minus six times k squared plus h squared plus three h times x, and then plus a constant term. But as we'll see, the constant term won't really matter here because, well, remember our goal is to solve for a, and once we've solved for a, we're pretty much good to go. Okay. So now let's notice that the coefficient of x cubed on the left-hand side is zero. So I'll just note here that if we extract x cubed from both sides of the equation, we get that 2h plus six equals zero. In other words, h is equal to negative three. Okay. And then, well, notice that on the left-hand side, the coefficient of x squared is one. On the right-hand side, well, it's a little bit more complicated, but that's gonna also give us an equation. So taking the coefficient of x squared from both sides of the equation, we have k squared plus h squared plus 12h plus nine is equal to one. But then plugging this value of h in here, we can solve for, well, you might think that we want to solve for k, but in fact, k only shows up being squared over there on the right-hand side of the equation, so we might as well solve for k squared. And what we'll see is that k squared is 19. Okay, great. And now, well, now let's look at the linear terms of both sides of this equation. And that's going to give us the following. So I'm just going to say that x terms here will tell us that, well, here we have a minus 2a, there we have a coefficient of minus 6, so we can go ahead and divide by minus 2, and that'll tell us that a is equal to 3 times k squared plus h squared plus 3h. So something like that. 
but notice that the h squared plus 3h is going to cancel once we plug in h equals minus 3. So we're simply left with 3 times k squared. We know k squared is 19. So that means that we know that a, a so that means that we know that a is 3 times 19. In other words, 57. Okay, so we've got a is equal to 57. Okay, so let's take that information and do the last couple steps. Okay, so we just determined that a was equal to 57. So now let's find the slope of the line segment between a zero and, let's see, this is three nine. In other words, from O to P. So I'll just write this as O P. So using like the change of y over change of x formula, what will we have? Well, we're gonna have nine minus zero over 3 minus 57, but that's going to turn into 9 over negative 54. In other words, minus 1 over 6. But we know that that is orthogonal, or in other words, perpendicular to our curve, but we can just take the negative reciprocal of that and we'll have the slope of the tangent. So in other words, the slope of the tangent here will be the negative reciprocal of negative 1 sixth. In other words, it'll be 6. But that's exactly what we expected, and that's a good place to stop.